Welcome everyone to this tutorial on how to do session prep in Pro Tools for an orchestral live recording session. This is a pretty standard way of delivery the way I'm about to show you. I've done this for myself, I've done this for other composers back when I was still assisting, and I've delivered files like that to stages and engineers around the world, including Abbey Road, Air, Galaxy Studios, the Fox and Sony stages here in town in LA. Now, pretty much 99% of the time you have to deliver Pro Tools sessions because almost all professional recording and mixing studios around the world are on Avid software. Sometimes the assistant engineer of the stage, if it's a higher end stage, will do the session prep for you if you give them audio and MIDI, but it's always safer and definitely appreciated if you create the Pro Tools sessions yourself and deliver in that particular format. So here it goes. Now, most of the time we are in 24 bit and 48 kilohertz, and most of our preparation will be in stereo only. Composers are usually not necessarily involved in delivering any surround files. Recording and mixing will be in surround most of the time, but the composer often has nothing to do with that beforehand. Now, name the session by what cue it is that you are preparing, because every cue gets its own session. It's not all in one session. Later it will be when you deliver to the dub, but for session prep purposes, every cue gets its own session. The first thing you want to do is import the picture reel that goes with the cue you are preparing. Make sure you import the correct picture version that this cue was written uh, or last conformed to so that it will line up later on. Also make sure your session is in the right frame rate that matches the picture. Then you go ahead and import all the audio stems that you or someone else exported from your composition DAW and add them to the clip list. And be sure to copy them into the audio folder of the session and not reference them. That's really important. There's a common issue with audio exported from Cubase. No other DAW has that issue. When printing stems from Cubase, make sure that this left-right LR box is checked. Only then Pro Tools will read the files correctly. Otherwise, it'll import them as multiple mono files and then give them a weird name like A1, A2. It will not even name them left, right or anything the way that Pro Tools would read them. And it essentially creates a lot of trouble down the line. So you only have to check this box once. It will remember the setting going forward until you change it again. Now you see that those audio files will have a timecode reference in the file name. We always do that. So go to spot mode in Pro Tools, drag the audio files into the grid and type in the correct timecode. And now the audio will line up to the picture. The next thing we need is the tempo map so that the grid and bar count line up with the audio. So for that, we select one of the audio regions then go to import MIDI and import it to the selection. This is very important because if you don't do that, it will import the MIDI to probably the session start or any other spot in the session and it will not line up to your audio. Now we can get rid of all the actual MIDI tracks because nobody needs that. All we needed was the tempo map. So all these MIDI tracks that were automatically created, uh, you can just delete. And now you'll see that the grid and bar count lines up with the audio just the way we want it. Then it's time to create the click track. I like to do this in Pro Tools using the standard URA click audio file because it's the fastest way for me to do it. And it gives me flexibility with mixed meters, warning clicks and other odd things that I might need. I tend to conduct my scores myself as well. So creating clicks this way can actually be very helpful down the line for me on the podium. You can also do this in your composition DAW or in many other ways, but be sure to use the URA click sound 
and make it even. So no accents on one and three or anything like that, because this is how studio musicians are used to it. So don't throw them off by just, you know, using something else, especially nothing that has a pitch. That's the most off-putting thing you could possibly do. Once I've copy-pasted the click into the grid, I consolidate the audio regions into one big audio file and rename it according to the naming scheme. Be sure to simultaneously rename the disk file as well. Something extra that I do that is not necessarily standard is I color code the tracks and I create groups. So it's easier to see what is what for whoever opens these on the other end. I essentially try to make these as clean as possible to avoid any confusion or misinterpretation, especially, you know, if the stage is on the other side of the planet and I can't fly out, you know, it's always good to be as clear as possible with as few questions as possible. So once I've played through the cue one last time, checking that the stems are identical to the stereo reference mix and that it all lines up with the sheet music, I go into the IO setup and clear it out entirely. I've been told that this will make it easier on the engineer's end when they import the session data into their template. And I will also clear out any unused data from the clip list. Just be sure to click remove instead of delete, otherwise things can get really messy. And that's all there is to it. I then zip up the file and send it to wherever I was instructed to send it. Usually the stage will have a transfer preference. The most common I've encountered are uh, Dropbox, WeTransfer, or often the stage will also have its own Aspera server that they want you to deliver to because it's safer. But it's best to ask them what their usually preferred method is and just go with that. Make it as easy as possible for them. If you work at a more old school studio, you may also find a setup where the composition DAW is hardwired into Pro Tools. And then Pro Tools is generally used as an output device. In those instances, you would sync the DAWs through timecode lock and then hit record in Pro Tools and then print stems and clicks directly in real time into Pro Tools. However, this is a very slow and outdated process. I would not recommend it if you can avoid it. I've only encountered this at studios that are using a custom sampling engine that can't offline bounce like the SAM engine at Remote Control Productions or studios that still use some old hardware sampling gear or hardware mixing gear that in general can't offline bounce. But if you use any modern software sampler like Contact, Play, the new Spitfire player, the player that Spectrasonics uses, UVI, any of these can offline bounce. So this old process isn't really necessary anymore. And there are some bugs in this process as well. The first click in a click track is always missing. There's some lag sometimes, so you manually have to line up the audio to the grid again. If a sample doesn't play back right, you essentially have to reprint the whole track. It just takes forever and is, from my experience, actually less reliable than uh, using offline bouncing. It didn't used to be that way, but now, honestly, I may have one offline bounce misprint in a thousand tracks. So it's really, really reliable. I've used this a lot in Logic, a lot in Cubase, and it's all extremely reliable these days. So if you can avoid this old process, I probably would. So that's essentially the whole thing. This seems easy enough, but it's very time consuming because a standard feature film has somewhere between 50 or 60 cues. So you will be doing this quite a few dozen times. This is also one of the reasons a lot of composers will give this task to an assistant so they can keep writing and do other important stuff. If you give it to someone else though, be sure to always check the sessions one last time unless you really, really blindly trust the person preparing those sessions. Because this is the last step before it goes to the stage. 
this is what will be used during the sessions. And sessions are really expensive. You do not want to use session time to fix anything that could have been caught beforehand and fixed beforehand. The stage crews at the higher end recording facilities are extremely experienced and they can do quick fixes during sessions. There's also usually multiple people, so if something is wrong in one session, you just move on to the next queue and then the stage assistant will fix that session prep so that you can go back to that queue and you don't lose session time. But honestly, sessions are stressful enough for everyone. So it's always better to not let it come to that and to just deliver impeccable session prep that doesn't have mistakes in it. I hope this was helpful. Uh, as usual, comment with any questions or any future requests and I'll see you next time.